Good morning. Good morning to everyone joining us online. We're going to sing, Open the Eyes of My Heart, Lord. the cutest little girl in the front pew. Those online can't see her, but she is beautiful. And that's my daughter. A cute little face. She's just looking up. She's going to be singing soon, huh? <laughs> um, next song we're going to sing is How Can It Be? Uh, and how can it be that God can love me for who I am? You know, a, a sinner, an uh, imperfect man, imperfect person. And I had seen something on Facebook and I thought it was pretty interesting, and I'm sure many people have seen it too. Um, it says, along the lines of, go to church. Even if, uh, you know, you're hungover, go to church. If you're drunk, go to church. If you're high, go to church. If you feel worthless, go to church. And um, the point it was making is that go to church and hear the word and uh, feel God's love for us, you know, the Satan wants us to feel like maybe we're unworthy, that we're not, we're not good enough to come into God's presence and um, and worship Him. But the truth is that God loves us uh, unconditionally. And Sebastian, my son, he was uh, he's asking me, "How much does God love us?" You know, I, yeah. And I said, "A lot, son." And he says, "Well, like a hundred." More than that, 100 million? So I, I said, son, there's no limit. 
There's no number he just loves unconditionally. There's no end to God's love for us. A uh, hundred, hundred million. What about past the sky? He just loves us. Um, and I think that that's, that's great. So we're going to sing, How Can It Be?
There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. Nothing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves, where my heart becomes free. And my shame is undone Your presence, Lord Holy Spirit, you are welcome here Come flood this place and fill the Somebody's put on there, and I'll read it. 
And after I've done done read it, I'll uh, I'll work out, you know, do some weights and ride the bike a little bit. Uh, and, and all of this is one to spiritually exercise myself. That's why the devotional. And the second thing is, you know, just try to maintain, stay in shape a little bit. Well, in, in all of this, this last week I, there was a devotional that came up that really got me to think, and there was a lot of stuff in it. I mean, there was there was some real good gems. I could my thoughts could have went almost in any direction because it's so full of, of good stuff. Uh, but what my mind got set upon was the idea of self-discipline. That if God's people could discipline themselves, then there would be no need for God to have to discipline them. But this goes to show you something. What it goes to show you is the difficulties in which we have as human beings to be able to discipline ourselves that God himself would, would, would move in a direction to try to help us along the way to correct us, which is for our benefit, not for, for our harm. That God would reach down and, 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 and touch us in such a way that, like a parent does with their child, you know, to, to try to correct them, really, to begin with, with words. You know, don't. Uh, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. Uh, but to a point where all of a sudden that won't correct it. And so severity has to take place to where God has to move in a, in a, in a manner. And, and I was thinking this morning, because it was part of Brother Scott's lesson, but I was already thinking about it, about the prodigal. The prodigal son who uh, had everything. There was nothing that he lacked as long as he lived at home with his father. He, he, he had it made. Uh, and the inheritance which he was going to receive, he would receive later on after the father had passed away, then it would become his. So he didn't really need to worry about his future. His, his presence was, the present was taken care of, his future was taken care of, and yet at the same time, something was inside of him said, I ain't got enough yet. Right? Something inside of him said that there is, there is more to experience, more to, to, to be had, so therefore... Give me my inheritance now. Let me go out into the world and let me let me figure this out for myself. See, that's the difficulty. The difficulty is had everything, but still there was something gnawing within inside of him that said, "But you ain't got it yet. There's more to be had." And so we're going to look at all that. Uh, and and fun, again, another funny thing is, is that Wednesday night we were all over this subject uh, in our lesson, and I don't, sometimes I. Don't, like I told Brother Scott, I don't know how we get to places and from different angles that we get to the same place. And the only answer that I can have for that is that the Holy Spirit moves in that direction. To, to bring us into a, a one-mindedness, uh, no matter where we might start, we get there. Right? And I think that's a beautiful, a beautiful thing. Uh, before we actually get into our, uh, our message, I'd like to go to the Lord Word Prayer, and I'd like you uh, to remember the the Pruitt family, uh, Sister Tina passed away this last week, uh, and also remember the Beat family, as they have called out their family to come and be with him, uh, not thinking that he's going to make it, but that he'll go to be with the Lord also. So be in prayer for the families, uh, that God might bring them comfort at this time in their lives. Let's go to Lord work. Father in heaven, we bow in your presence with gratitude with inside of our hearts for all that you have done and all that you continue to do in our lives. Father, for, for simple lessons in which you teach us to, to try to make our lives a little bit more full, a little bit more like you would have them to be. Father, the, the, the way that you care for us, is, it, it, it's really tough to, to understand why, but still at the same time, we know that you do, and, and because you do, we are thankful. We just ask that you watch over us and, and protect us and, and lead us and guide us into the places in which you would have us to be. Open our hearts that we might be able to receive your word and that your word might move us in directions that uh, are pleasing in your sight, but also are good for our lives. Father, we pray for anyone that might be lost uh, if they're hearing this message. I pray, Heavenly Father, that they might come to a point of realizing their lost condition before you and understand that how much you, you love them. No, you don't love our sin, but you, you look past our sin and Jesus came and died in our place so that we might have the forgiveness of sin and we might have a place with you in heaven. So, Father, I pray that, that, that 
you would watch over us as your people, that we might carry the word of salvation with us wherever we might go. For those who we come into contact with might, might hear it, and then might actually be able to see it with inside of our own lives. Father, for the, the two families, our families, that, that are hurting at this moment of time, for the Pruitt family, for the Beach family, we pray, Heavenly Father, that your, your comfort might be upon their lives, that you might uh, help them to, to see the greater, the greater thing, and that is that we don't pass from this life without going to be with you in heaven. We leave here only to arrive in the place that you have for us. And so, Father, be with them, comfort them, strengthen them, and help them that they might uh, stand together uh, so that they might be a comfort one to another. Father, forgive me where I fail you, and help me that I might present your word in ways to please me in your sight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <clears throat> Got a piece of paper? Everybody? Piece of paper? A pen? Pencil? Get it, because I, I can't move on until you got it. Because there's something I want you to do that I hope will actually make the message a little bit more full. Uh, and it's not much, it's not, not a major thing. I'm not going to be throwing things around this morning. I'll keep it a little bit calmer than I did last week. But what I want you to do right now is to write down on this, your piece of paper. The sin that is so easy to get you off track with God. What sin that you have in your life that easily gets you off track with God? In other words, not one that uh, necessarily that you have right now, but one that you have often, that it often gets you off track with God. And, and don't be ashamed of it because God already knows. You're not, you're, not, you're not revealing anything to Him that He doesn't already know, that He doesn't already see. Now, if I was going to teach or preach a message on confessing your faults one to another, I would have you hand your paper over to somebody else, right? So that you can confess that to that person. What I want you to do is to realize that, and understand and, and grasp the hold of that sin which often takes you away. And if you say, but, but Brother Jeff, I don't think I have one, then write down liar. Okay? Because we all have them. You know, there isn't, there isn't a one of us that doesn't have some kind of hidden sin that we, we don't bring out and show to everybody else. They may see it, but we don't, we don't purposely uh, adorn ourselves with this sin so people can see it and, and, and realize, hey, well, he's just, just a human being. Keep it. Hold it. Don't let it go. And we'll get back to it in time. Okay? Proverbs 19, verse 18 says, Chasten thy son while there is hope, and let not thy soul spare for his crime. If you were to look at the NIV, the very same verse says this, Discipline your children, for in that there is hope. Do not be a willing party to their death. That one's hard. You know, usually you go to the NIV because the NIV will soften it for you just a little bit. King James is the hard one. It's the one that really gets at, gets at us and, and, and brings us to that place. Uh, but the NIV is usually a little soft. But it's, it, and, and you understand what it's saying. It, basically, it's saying that discipline your children because in that there is hope. Which says that if you don't discipline your children, then you're, you're leaving them into a, a, a hopeless situation. Right? So... Uh, and then we just become a party to, to the things in which they that happen to them in their lives, you know. And, and don't think that you can escape it because you can't, as a, as a parent, ever escape the fact that if your child uh, goes off the beating path, we all know that. And so the, the truth that is revealed to us in that scripture is that now, at this moment of time, while it is that they are under your roof, while it is that that they are they are in your under your control somewhat. Discipline them because in discipline there is hope. And so, what we're going to look at, and we're going to eventually see, is that it is a loving thing to do to discipline your children. It is a loving thing that God disciplines us. It's loving. It's, it's not because he, he wants to stop us from having fun. 
Maybe we ought to put our fun thing in, in, a, in a better place. But what he wants us to do is to grow, go and have a, 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 a beautiful life that is filled with goodness. Instead of always having to try to overcome the things that happen to us in our life because of what it is that we're going through. We are now going to look at David, which is what we did Wednesday night. And we're going to take a little slow walk with David on this, okay? Because I want you to see, I was telling my daughter earlier that, uh, man, that uh, I think there's so much missing in this story. And she goes, no, it's pretty full. I said, no, 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 no. There's something missing, something that we know, something that we've experienced, something that we're very closely related to with inside the story that, that is not being told. But we're going to examine it, and we're going to look at it, and we're going to see that David should have definitely had a little bit more self-control. So that David had self-control, he wouldn't have fallen into such problems. So, 2 Samuel, the 11th chapter, if you have, if you have your Bibles with you, you're going to open it there. We're going to begin ourselves in verse 1. 2 Samuel, chapter 11, verse 1. It says that it came to pass after the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle. Hold the buck. At a time when kings go to the battle, it says that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all of Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabah. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. At a time when Kings go to battle. When they go to war, they were, they were examples of, of, of the warrior out there in the field. That, that the cause in which, you know, wouldn't it, be, wouldn't it give our, our president a little bit more of a, a pause if when he wanted to send our troops into battle, he had to go with them? Wouldn't, wouldn't it make a difference in, in, in the way they saw things? That you would strip it all of the political part and, and realize that what it is is a battle between good and evil. That's what life is really all about. We have that own battle in our own lives. We have that in the world in which we live. That, that we have to overcome sin because of the good in which God places us inside of our lives to be able to do that. But if kings went to battle, when, when they sent their soldiers in, they would, they would be apt not to send them so often. Because they would have to be out there. But here's David. We've been talking about him. Why wasn't he at the battle? Why didn't he go when he sent everybody else? When, when it was his duty, it was his, it was his responsibility to go and, and fight with the soldiers in the battle that was before them. Why? Because I think there's something right there that, that is hidden from us that, that if it could be revealed... Exactly what was going on inside of his heart, what was going on inside of his mind, what was going on in his life, that he decided, you know what, I'm going to pass on this one. I'm just going to stay here. So that's the first one. As we continue on in verse 2, it says, And it came to pass in an evening time that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. Okay. So David had something going on in his mind. He had something going on in his life, something, something that was disturbing him, right? At a time when he would, should be asleep and getting rest, he couldn't get to sleep. He, he couldn't find that restful position. He, 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 you could almost see tossing and turning or maybe just laying awake staring at the ceiling. Something going on, something in his heart, something in his mind. And so... He's so restless that he decided, well, I'll get up and I'll go walk. Take a little stroll. So he takes a stroll out of his bedroom in, onto the, uh, into the outside, you know, walking upon his roof. He comes to a place where he sees a woman. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself. And the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And so I say to myself, does David come across this place at this point, at this time, by accident? Did he, did he walk directly to a location where he might would see her? 
had he seen her before? You know, because honestly, we, we, we don't know any of that kind of stuff. What we do see is, is David walking to a place where he sees a woman who's bathing herself. So he's looking directly. And in my estimation of this, this is where we go right back to the point where why did he not go to war? Because there was other things that were going on, and we know this. We know this very well because we don't just come come upon a, a, a place where all of a sudden our sin, especially the one that gets us all the time, that, that we didn't work our way up to it. That, that it, does, it might come easily when it finally arrives, but it's usually many things that go on with inside of our lives that bring us to a point of, of that very sin and then acting upon it. Because you can't let it go. It causes us to become restless. So David looks in, in the direction of Bathsheba, beautiful Bathsheba, and he sees her baby. Okay, David, a little self-control would really be nice right about now, right? To, to, to show some restraint. And isn't that what sometimes where, where we get to and, and God is speaking to us and says, you know, we're up to this point. Wouldn't it be good if you just showed a little bit of self-discipline at this moment? You, you can overcome the situation if you'll turn towards me and, 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 and stop it as, it as it begins to you know, get speed. But David continues on. Then David sent and inquired after the woman. And she said, or in one said, is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, uh, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite? And I began to think about Uriah for a second. Just to, just to let, you know, might as well fill in some of these blanks. Uriah was not a, he wasn't a, a Jew, but he was one that had inhabited the land, or his forefathers had inhabited the land prior to the children of Israel taking possession of it. So was his family one that was just kind of left behind, and he, he stayed there. Now he's not... He is not just nobody. He is, he is a warrior. He is a soldier. Right? He, he is in the ranks of those who are out there fighting the battle. <clears throat> Which makes me think, if he's not from the area, maybe he moved in. Maybe, maybe he... You see, I'm taking you so far that you say, this, ain't, this ain't written. But maybe they moved in. And maybe he, David got a glimpse of this beautiful Bathsheba as he was moving in. Somehow, he, 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 he must have had seen her prior to this point because everything that it is leading up to is that he, couldn't, he didn't go to war. He couldn't sleep at night. He couldn't stroll upon the roof. And all of this is leading to, the, to him seeing something that he should not be seeing. He probably should have turned away at the moment of time he got the view. But he couldn't. See, it had already gotten him. It, it, it's already bitten him. The snake has already bitten. The poison is running through his, through his body. There's no turning back. Have you ever gotten to a point of no return? I have. And isn't that the story of the prodigal? Is that that when he asked for it and he received the inheritance that he was supposed to get later on, now he's got to go. He's got to go. And, and the only way to bring him back is to get him to realize his condition. David's condition was, was deteriorating all along the way. It was getting worse and worse and worse. David made an inquiry. And somebody told him, isn't this Uriah's wife? Having made the inquiry, what we see in verse 4 is it says, And David sent messengers and took her, and she came in unto him. And he lay with her, for she was purified from her uncleanness, and she returned unto her house. And the woman conceived, and sent and told David, and said, I am with child. Now, 
this is the end of it, and you know that as well as I do. I think this is sufficient for us to see the, the way that, that sin rolls. You know, God said, when a man is tempted, don't say that God tempts you. But when a man is tempted, he's drawn away of his own lust and, and, and enticed. And when sin has, and, and, and so therefore he sins, and when sin has, has finished, it brings forth death. It, it rolls, and it continues on, and, it, and, it, and, it, and it's what really eats the fabric of our lives. Mainly, because we, we fail, not that we don't know. See, it's, that's kind of the point with me. It's not that we don't know, we know all too well. And so sin doesn't creep up upon us and, and, and you know, it's like flashing lights and says, sin, sin. It's subtle. It's easy. It's, it's something that, that we gravitate towards and, and next thing you know, we're smack dab in the middle of it and it, and it has ruined and raised havoc upon our lives. And see, that's the, the, the message I want you to understand. Because while David, and we're going to look at let's just go ahead and look at it now. I'm getting ahead of myself, and, and Amanda's probably thinking, why would you do that? Because you know, you can't. Well, somewhere David should have exercised self-discipline. Right? Somewhere he should, have, he should have exercised that. But instead, he just allowed it to continue to roll. And he made the inquiry, he sent for messengers, and he lay with that season. Right? That, that's, he owns that. What is, was the stake for David? Was his integrity. Integrity, according to the, the dictionary, sa- says that it is the quality of being honest and having strong moral principles, moral uprightness. And when it talks about being honest, it talks about being true. That's that's the that's the type of honesty we're talking about. Being true. We are we are. It's like when you go to the lumber yard and you're going to pick out wood to to build something. And you examine the wood before you actually load it up and pay for it. You, you examine it to make sure it's, it's true, right? You don't want one that's all over like this because that ain't going to go well once you actually use it within the framework of what you're trying to build. So you look for it to be nice and straight. Well, David's integrity, his, his, his honesty, his trueness, it was, it was at stake here, right? He was the king. He, he was the one... Who, who people were to be able to look at, you know, and, 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 and see what, what it is that we could all become. This is, this is what, if, if we just put a little effort into it, if we just tried, if we just gave ourselves over to, to God and His Spirit and His Word, if we just allow that to be, then we, what could we become if we just allowed God to do the building? He had a he had a flaw. He had he had a sin, and with this sin carrying farther and farther and farther. Psalm fifty one says this. This is David's prayer of repentance and forgiveness as he comes to a realization. Of his sin. And here, here just for a second, <coughs> think about it this way. The sin in which David commits, I, I, it, to, to us, we would look at it from our lofty perch. We look down upon it and we say, that's a bad one. That one there, that's bad. But it's no worse than the one that you're holding in your hand. Because sin is sin as far as God is concerned. Sin will, will always carry its, its consequences. David comes to a place where God has sent him a, a, a prophet and told him, Hey, David, what would you do in this case? Somebody stole somebody else's sheep. <coughs> well, I'd have him replace the sheep and kill it. Right? Well, you are that man. David was easily, <clears throat> by God, through His Word, through His by Spirit, easily come to a place of repentance. This is why we, we find that 
Scripture says he's a man after God's own heart. Because it, deep down was inside of him, though his flesh was weak, deep down inside of him, <coughs> he was no different than you and me. He had a desire <coughs> for God. He, his heart was in that direction. His, his physical body, his his, his mortal self? No. He struggled. Like you and I do. But in his heart, he had a love for God. And so you have to realize that when he's brought to a place where he can see his sin, David doesn't want to leave it that way. David wants to be clean of that. When you discipline your children, are there times when you don't want them really, but you just got to? You know you got to, so you do. And then your child comes up to you and says, I'm sorry, Daddy. I love you. It'll break your heart. You know? But it's because they want to please you. And they truly, I do believe, love you. And so, there's David. His flesh got the best of it. And I'm not trying to make light of it. But his heart was belonged to God. So when he when the opportunity was there, he made things right. Listen what David said. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgression. Wash me truly from mine iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against thee only have I sinned, and done this evil uh, in, in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. All of a sudden, I think he, he saw himself as a, a son of disappointment. And it's hard. It's hard to, to, to be brought to that place where all of a sudden we realize that our life could be seen as a disappointment before God. That the things in which we have done, we've allowed and it forced Him to move in a direction because we wouldn't listen. We wouldn't heed. And therefore, he had to be a little bit more severe with his actions. It's hard because I don't think any of us want to be a disappointment to God. Sometimes you, you've got to look at life the way that maybe God might see it. And say to ourselves, you know, where do we go off wrong? Where do we go off the beaten path? Why couldn't we stop when we had the opportunity? Why did we allow it to continue when it, when it didn't need to? Why would I give all that I had with God away? for what I could have just for a moment in this world. It's got to stop before it gets going. Now, that's the first thing. Now, before it gets going, you got to stop. you got to realize that, that this little sin is going to take me on much further than I really want to go. Because it never stops with the little sin. It just continues to gain momentum and become greater and greater and greater. Where was his sin? Well, for David, it was probably when he first got a glimpse of Bathsheba. Wherever that might have been and how that might have been, when he first glanced her, got a glimpse of her, I was you know, oh, man. His heart just goes, i, I got to have me back. Right? That's, 
And but then find out she's married and all of a sudden it's but his heart. You know, his heart was there. That's probably where it started. If you can't get it stopped when it gets started, then you've got to get it before it actually takes root. When it when it really grabs finds a place that's inside of your, your heart, it's just it's there and it's it's taking root and all of a sudden it, that will lead to the next step, the final step, which is the, the action. So you've got to stop it before it hardens your heart. Children of Israel out in the uh, wilderness, they, if, if ever a, per, a people could have said, you know, we are, we have to be a disappointment. The children of Israel at this first stage, this first generation of people that were supposed to enter into the promised land, what a, what a disappointment. It had to be a disappointment for their kids. I know it was a disappointment for Joshua and Caleb. Because they kept sticking in there, you know. They, they never gave up. They were two boats in the affirmative that we can go ahead and take this land because God is going to fight for us. He's going to give us the victory. So in verse 7 of the third chapter of the book of Hebrews, this is what is written. It says, Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost said, Today, if you will hear His voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation, in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years, Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation and said, They do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swear my wrath, they shall not enter into my wrath. Severity? Yeah. They harden their hearts against God. And, and you know, I think the one thing that, that sticks out the most to me in those scriptures is this. That truth. That God says, I've, I've, I've walked with you for 40 years, and, and you still don't know my ways. You don't know me. 40 years. I've walked you through. I, I gave you a rock that followed you everywhere you went so that it, you might have the water that, it, that you needed. Right? I rained down quail from the sky so you have food. See, I gave you everything. I took care of you. 40 years. And you did not, you, you didn't notice what it was that I was doing for you in your life. Or you just took it for granted and you didn't care. Forty years and I brought you to a place where I said, okay, but it's time to go on in so that you can have that place that I promised you. Forty years I brought you here. Now all you got to do is go in and possess it. And here's what they said. No. All right, 40 more years. 40 more years. Who was it that God was disappointed with? This is what the Scripture says. With those who look who, who like dead in the wilderness. He said, you will not enter into my rest. Well, here's the thing about David again. He got forgiven. He got placed in a, in a, in a right place with God. You are my son. I am your father. David, you could tell that, that his relationship was full with God because of the songs he wrote. Right? But there, he, had a, he had a love for God that, that, that was very beautiful because of, of what God placed inside of his heart and he put the, the pen to it. But he did not get out from underneath the consequences of his sin. What happened? So well, God told him that the sword will never leave your house. And never left his house. He had to fight his own kids to be king. Never left his house. He was not allowed to build God a, a, a temple because he was a man of, of, of blood. So he, he was unable to give God what he wanted to give him from the from the deep down with inside of his heart because of the consequences of his sin. He lost the child that was that he had with Bathsheba. You know that hurt. So what I'm telling you is that we may find a place of forgiveness with God 
but sometimes the, the, the result of what it is that we have, we have allowed with inside of our lives, we live with that. And we will have to live with that. It doesn't mean God loves us any less. That's actually to prove that God loves you that much more. Because what we have done that, that deserves probably death, God has, has renewed with inside of us life. There is none of us who, who are worthy of what God has given when He gave His only begotten Son to die in our place. There is none of us that deserve God to continue to walk with us day in and day out, to move us along, to, to provide for us the things that are needful for our lives. None of us deserve it, but God gives it. God loves us. And back to your child or our children. What what we learn as far as chastisement goes from what he says in our scripture reading, he says, Chase in thy son while there is hope. That there is hope. There is hope with inside of, of, of doing what you need to do to discipline your children when it is that they, they, their temper is, is to do something that is wrong. And when they get to a point where that, that their temper is so much towards it that they, that they can't seem to get away from it, that they continue to do it. Look, there was a day, back in the day, in, in, in church, right? In church, what you would hear probably more often than anything else was, no, Daddy, no, as he's marching him out the door. <laughs> I was thinking about my dad this week. And maybe that's what got me off at this point, is that I can remember as he would be literally spanking us, and while he is spanking us, and we're running around in circles, that, that we would be pleading with him. You know, no, Dad, no, no, bam, bam, no, bam. Uh, discipline. He never, he didn't kill me. I'm still here. But the discipline which we received that was to correct the things in our lives that, that many times got out of control, God took that and, and, he, and, he, and he shows it to you and He says, this is what we do. This is, this is what I'm doing for you. Now, this is what you do for yours. Right? It, we're seeing discipline through the eyes of God. How did God discipline David? In the same way that we are to discipline our own children. When their hearts are tender enough to hear the word and tell them, teach them. You know, one of the, I think one of the biggest mistakes that has been made in a person's life is, is this. When a child comes to you and says to you, why can't I do this? Let's take dancing for an example. Why can't, why can't I dance? When the answer comes back to you, because I told you so. It lacks anything. It doesn't give you a reason. It doesn't. God gives us reason. You know that? God gives us reason with the side of His Word of why this is bad and why that is bad. And why you shouldn't do this and why you should do that. He gives us reason. It's not, it's not just a flat out, you know, because I told you. I mean, that's good enough when God speaks. But... The truth is, is he also lets us know exactly why that is bad for us. And then when it turns out that he was right, we learn from the left. Your child will learn. They'll learn from the lessons in which you teach them. We have to, one, be good role models of what it is that we are actually trying to tell them. And we have two, have to continue to stress the importance of, of, of the Word within the side of their life. And three, we, we, we need to continue to move them in a direction where they themselves will see the value of knowing God for themselves. Because when God finally gets a hold of their heart, they have that, and you have that to reinforce what it is that you're trying to get across to them. Let's 
Romans, the fifth chapter, says, And hope maketh not a change, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Chasten your son when there is hope. Hope that what it is that, that, that is in their lives can be, can be dealt with and taken, out, taken away so that their lives might be full of goodness and not of harsh, hard times. I, I mean, I've had friends, by the way, who got hooked on drugs and things like that. And you just see that somewhere down the line, somebody should have helped them and made them understand that this is going to destroy their life. They just keep on going. You know? Somebody should have helped them while there was still hope. But once it becomes something that they are addicted to, something that they have hardened themselves against, hope begins to diminish. Hope is God's proof of love. That, that it says to you and I that God loves me, and so there is still hope in my life. There's still hope in, in, in something better. There's still hope in, in, in renewal because God loves me. But when sin begins to take hold, it needs to be taken care of early. Now, two quotes for you. First one is, it is easiest plucking up weeds as soon as they spring up. You want to get, let them get to be bushy? They're a little more difficult. When they first get a sign of, of that weed, pluck it. Help, help them to get rid of it. Second one. The ox that is designed for, for the yoke should also be made accustomed to it. Take strain. I don't think that God expects us to be super Christians right off the bat. You know, you're saved, now, now walk the line. You know, that's, that's one of the reasons why I think it's hard to have a man-made set of rules placed upon your, your wall. Because... To the new, to the newcomer, the, the one who just accepts Jesus as as their Savior, that thing is going to be difficult. It's going to be an, almost an impossibility. And every time they see it, every time they read it, then all of a sudden they become guilty before God because that thing is telling them they, that they fall short all the time. Well, you know what tells me that I fall short? Right here. God's Word tells me I fall short. This is the best instruction that anybody can have and to apply to their life, to allow this to... To, to be a part of who, who they are. Train. Train. Train your child in the way he, he should go. Hebrews 12, verse 1 says, Wherefore, seeing we, are, we also are compassed about with so great a crowd of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily death beset us. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Get rid of the cares. Get rid of the fears. Get rid of all the concerns. It's weighing you down. You got to run the what race. You got got to get rid of all those things that are holding you back. Get rid of the doubt. Because we're not we're not we're not running this race based upon our ability to run faster than everybody else. We're running this race because God Himself is working in us to do the running. So get rid of those, those, those things that you usefully are holding you down. And lastly, he says, get rid of the sin. So take that sin and what you wrote down on that piece of paper. Get rid of it. Whatever it is. If it's one that you, you easily fall prey to, then understand it, see it for what it is, and know this ain't going to be any good for your life. Get rid of it. You can't run the race as long as you are carrying around that sin. And so, I know i got stuff in my life. Stuff that, that they're not even creeping up on me anymore. They're just there. It's, 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 it's like every morning I, I look in the mirror, I see my nose. It's right before me. I don't have to go looking for it. It's there. Right? It hasn't fallen off yet. I've not left it behind. It's here. Well, every morning that I look in the mirror, I can see the sinful man that I am. But why continue to hold on to it if 
you know it's a problem, why not get rid of it? Because this is going to be the question that you parents ask yourselves in the time to come. Why can't little Johnny just stop doing that? Why can't little Johnny just, you know, love his sister? Why can't little Johnny just be, be, be kinder? Why, why does he always have to, you know, ridicule everybody that he sees? You're going you're gonna to realize that the need will be is to help little Johnny to let that thing go. Show what it means to be kind. Help him then to continue to move towards kindness. And he'll get there. In time. But you've got to continue to work with him. You can't, you can't turn blinders on, blind eyes to the situations which, which is going on. I think that happens so often. You know, it's been easier, easy for me to just to say, well, you know, my kids are going to turn out to be perfect. Why? Because they're, they're part of a pastor's family. And because I have the rank, then the, they'll all fall in line. They're going to be good kids because they have to be, because I'm a pastor. And I think they're good kids because, despite the fact that I'm a pastor. You know, the fact of the matter is, is it, it takes work. It takes effort. But eventually, it takes self Because that's what we're moving towards. We're moving our own children to the point where they themselves can conduct their own lives in a manner which would be pleasing unto God and show self discipline. That's what God does for us. He continues to, to convict us, He continues to move us in the right direction for His name's sake. He continues to love us even in our failures. So that one day, we make the choice. I love David Scott, and I know that I've been going on for a little bit this, this morning. And I love something that he said this morning. You're going to hear on his lesson when you go back and listen, watch him. And that is, he, he talks about being a famous clock watcher in church. And we have potluck today, and ladies are probably saying, man, he's going on a little bit longer today. Who's starting to get a little bit uh, overdone? You know, it's drying out. Anticipation, my friend. Anticipation. It's a lovely thing. And he said, really, on potluck, it was words to be a clock watcher. We have such little time be able to do the things that we need to do, that it's time, I believe, for us to be able to say no to sin and yes to God. Make it a turnaround. Make it a change. For if we sin willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sin, but a certain fearful looking for it or of judgment fiery is the indignation which shall devour the, the adversaries. And I got a, a fresher look at this this week just from this, this standpoint. That as, a, as, as the people of Israel would begin to move back, you know, to fall away from where they had been brought to in, in obeying God uh, and accepting Christ as their Messiah, that there are many of them who, who couldn't continue to stop. And what would they go back to? They'd go back to their rituals. They'd go back to their traditions. They would go back to their sacrifices. And so he says unto them, if you fall back, there is no more sacrifice for sin. But the only sacrifice that is needed and the one that is provided is what Jesus did when he went to the cross. So there's no need for you to fall away and to go back to where you came from. What it is time for is to, is to move forward. To let, let the discipline of God in our lives be able to take hold so that we, in this, in this life in which we live, can, can live a life pleasing to Him and self-disciplined by us. 
Withhold not correction from the child, for if thou beatest him with a rod, he'll not die. I pray. I pray for you, parents. We live in a crazy world. Would have never thought that BLM would have been put up for a peace prize, but what do you know? What, what do you know? And your kids are going to grow up in a crazy town. It, 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 I've never seen anything like this before in my life. Uh, it makes me feel old, to be honest with you, to even say that, because <clears throat> I remember my grandparents saying stuff like that. I've, I've never had a, a lock on my door before. You know, it, here we are in a time where right is, is wrong and wrong is right, and, and it just it, it boggles the mind. And I think to your kids growing up in, in, in the system which is out there at this point in time, man, it, it's difficult. But all things are possible to the God who loves us. All things are possible. Learn to trust. Learn to believe. Learn to obey. And God is in the field. I pray that as we come to the close of this message, that if there be any that do not know Jesus as your Savior, to come to a place of having a relationship with God is to come to Jesus. In order for God to be my heavenly Father, I must accept the sacrifice of Jesus for my sin and, and be forgiven of it and brought into a place of sonship. Accept Jesus this morning. He, he laid down His life as a sacrifice for your sins so that you might not have to, to live in, underneath the pressure of that sin for the rest of your life. Let God show you forgiveness. Let Him show you mercy. Let Him, let him cleanse you of the things that which are... are are holding you back. Accept Jesus this morning while you have this opportunity. And if you, like the prodigal, have, have decided to go out, has it gotten bad enough yet in your life where you're ready to return? Has it gotten hard enough to, to try to maintain what it is that you're trying to do in life, to be, to be happy, to be free, to be, to, to be able to do whatever it is that you choose to? Has it gotten to a point yet that you realize that you squandered it all away. Return to Jesus today. Don't stay out there. Don't don't stay out there any longer than you have to. Come back to Jesus today. Let Jesus show you what it means to have a good life. Will you do that today? Now listen to the Lord's word for us.
when temptation comes my way. And when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay.